Hey guys, I hope you're doing well today. Um, I, it's a joy always to be with you. Um, today I'm going to talk about the ins and outs of leadership. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time together and I thank you for your for your word and your Holy Spirit, Father. Just permeate the atmosphere with your love and your grace and your kindness. Father, you are always ever so kind. Um, although we are human, you are divine in the most greatest way ever, and we love you for that. And we love you for being forgiven gracious, loving, and always willing to, willing to correct us in the most uh, gracious way possible. Lord Jesus, as we talk about leadership today, Lord, I pray that you endow me with your spirit and your power and your grace, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey guys, um, today I'm going to talk about the ins and outs of leadership. Now, when I think of leadership, I've got many definitions from Webster's and um, uh, Wikipedia, but I like my definition better. My definition of a leader is someone who casts who cast vision for an individual or an organization. So, my, my definition of a leader is someone who casts vision for themselves an individual or an organization. What I mean by cast vision, it means to see the uh, potential and the outcome of an organization. So casting vision is to see the potential and outcome of an organization and to follow it through. That's vision casting. Um, and I think everyone in leadership needs to be first a vision caster. Before you lead anything, including your own life and yourself, you need to see vision. You need to um, have a general idea of what your life is supposed to be. And I'm not saying have a very specific idea because God has a way of surprising you. But at least have a general idea uh, idea of, of where you're going and at first that general idea needs to come from the Holy Spirit and if the Holy Spirit isn't involved in your vision casting then it won't go anywhere um, people said for a for a lack of knowledge, the people perish. I would say, for a lack of, of, of vision, people perish. I, I don't mean to uh, exegete, take out from the word of God, but I've come to understand that Sometimes, even with knowledge, without vision, 
about how to apply that knowledge, how to use it in a, an effective way. Um, it doesn't make any sense to have all this knowledge. People have so much knowledge, but they don't have the understanding or the vision how to, how to apply it. So I would say, uh, for a lack of knowledge, the people perish, yes. But for a lack of vision, um, the people perish. So I think the first step to leadership is having vision, seeing where you're going. Not really a goal, but you have to see it before you see it. And and when you see it, it could be different than what you see, but at least you have a road map. And leadership has to be um, some of the time um, open to change. If you're a leader that's not open to change and open to fluctuation, um, leading anything, whether it be yourself or whether it be an organization or whether it be a family, will frustrate you. Because leadership never goes um, into a straight line. Leadership always has twists and turns because life has twists and turns and we need to be open to that as leaders and we often think that that um, only people that lead companies or organization is a leader are leaders but um, I would say everyone is a leader because Everyone has to guide and facilitate and give instructions for their either their own life or leading a family or leading a organization or a group. So everyone is a leader in some way, whether you're leading yourself or whether you're leading other people. Everyone is a leader in its own way and their own way and leadership is very difficult because you you are when you're leading other people you have so many different personalities so real leadership takes the holy spirit to illuminate and to to give light to a certain circumstance and um, like and you could find several books on how to lead and whatever and several books by CEOs of organizations at the end of this video I will give you some that I have read and that I found really helpful but the bottom line about leadership is it takes um, a wanting to know people, even, either the people you're employing or the people that are receiving service from the people that you are employing. And I think a part of leadership um, comes from being curious, curious about people and how they operate and how they work through problems and uh, celebrating the strengths of people and, um, and their celebrating their strengths and helping them with their weaknesses and seeing this is what this is why it's 
um, so challenging to lead because you have different personalities and you have your own personality to contend with, your own strengths and your own weaknesses. And sometimes in leadership, you can find that you're weak at something, but another person is strong at the thing that you're weak at. And then to bring that person on board will be the, be the wisest thing. That's why, too, leadership takes humility. Leadership's saying that I don't know everything. I, I know I don't know everything, but I'm open to learning, too. Leaders are learners. I'll say that again. Leaders are learners. If you're not a learner, you're not a leader. Um, and when you are a learner, people are more apt to follow you because you're open to say, hey, I don't know everything, I'll find out. Sometimes the, the, the greatest thing you could say as a leader is, I don't know, let me find out for you. Um, or let me look that up, or let me, um, let me source that out for you. And that's why leadership, uh, takes revelation as well, because revelation will, will, will teach you how to, um, deal with that person how to deal with that situation, how to handle that situation in your business, how to structure this and how to structure that. Uh, when, when, Mo, when um, Noah was building the tower, was building the ark, and when David was building the tabernacle, and when Solomon was rebuilding uh, the tabernacle, geez, uh, God was really specific. He gave really specific instructions. He led those men to, to do it specifically uh, through his revelation. Without his revelation, they couldn't do it. He, do it. They couldn't do it well. And you could read all the John Maxwell books that you want. You can read every leadership book ever. But bottom line, I think the key to uh, being a good leader is to be open to revelation. Be open to doing things differently. Be open to change. Be open to mystery. Be open to, like, learning from the least of these. And another thing about leadership, too, I want to say this. I want to say everyone on a team, you may be the leader, you may be the vision caster, but Everyone, every single person, from the pastor to the janitor to the CEO to, to the person serving your food in the cafeteria, every person on a team is valuable. So don't think the job makes the person. And don't think a pe a PhD person is smarter than a janitorial person. A PhD is just paperwork. That that's all it is. Uh, PH, PhD people or doctorate people have knowledge 
but it doesn't mean that because they didn't go to school, uh, janitors don't have knowledge. They may have a different kind of knowledge than the PhD student, but it doesn't mean they're less valuable or the person that works at the desk is less valuable than the person working in the factory m manufacturing the product. So when you're a leader, be open to listen to everyone in your organization, whether staff or whether um, the customers, because that's where you'll make the organization better. The reason I I know this is because um, the Lord has been preparing me for years to lead uh, um, a production company of films and of books and of and of music. He's been preparing me for years for that po position. And although I'm not in those positions yet, the knowledge he, he showed me is incredible because I'm open to change. I'm open to revelation. I, in my life, there's been many zigzags, but in the zigzags, I get the most lessons. And it is phenomenal. And today, as well, I want to talk about uh, three different types of leading styles. Um, I talked about leadership. I talked about vision casting. Um, so let's talk about let's talk about uh, different societies and different. Uh, leading styles. There, there is a kind of leader called, and a kind of society, here, for these three points, I'm using leader and society interchangeably. So, first, I'm going to talk about theocratic leadership. The theocratic leadership and then I'm going to talk about a uh, dictative leadership or a dictatorship society and then I'm going to talk about a democratic leadership or a democratic society so first is theocratic leadership or society. Second is um, de democratic leadership or society. And third is dictator leadership or society. Okay. Or oh, I might have switched those around by accident, but the first one is theocratic leadership or society. The theocratic leadership or society means that God, what God says goes. God is the leader. What he says, what the Bible says, what his word says goes. And that's how we govern ourselves. So theocratic is what God says goes. And that's how we govern ourselves. We govern ourselves by God's law, God's rule, and that's it. Whatever God says goes. 
democratic leadership or a democratic society is, is what the people say goes. And so people vote on their leaders and who they want in power. So it's basically what the people say goes. And that's how we govern ourselves. So when we talk about a democratic society, we're talking about a people-led society. And that's how we govern ourselves. And the great thing about democratic society is you, you get a lot of different people leading in, and for that, you need to come up with a consensus because you can't have all these different laws. So what you need to do is come up with a consensus and and then and then from that consensus you create laws. Now sometimes in a democratic society you do have uh, biblical uh, laws but we are not like thou shall not steal, thou shall not kill, uh, you know we don't we don't encourage lying or whatever but the downfall of being a democratic society is that because people change and because mores change, the laws of the society change based on the mores and, and feelings and whims of the people. So, so that's why you see all these things coming in because like gay marriage and different ways to define um, sexuality or whatever is because the mores of society are changing. The needs of society are changing. And um, that's because if a society is governed by people's choice, then you take the collective opinion and make laws out of that. You do have some biblical basis to some laws, but generally you take what the people think and should be as your your laws as a consensus. So that's why now you have all this um, marriage equality and all, all this uh, general, all this um, different uh, moral stuff coming into law because it's the people that govern. Now, if it was God that governs, if this was a theocratic society, then we could say, okay, we'll go to the Bible, and what does the Bible say? Whatever the Bible says, we will do, because this is a, a theocratic society. But because it's a democratic society, then we just have to take uh, the mores of people, and that's how I explain it as a Christian. As a, as a believer, I believe this, but living in a democratic society where the people can choose who governs them, and the people have a say, have all the say and all the power, and because of the changing mores, now people 
um, now laws change, and, and, you know, it's so strange because now you have communities like the Christian communities trying to enforce what I'm going to say is going to be very controversial, and forgive me, but you have Christians uh, trying to enforce Christian laws on society, on a society that was never meant to be Christian. We only, like, way back when, that is all we knew. We only knew about God. We only knew about this, and we only knew about that. So that's what our society was governed on. It was never meant to be a strictly um, Christian society. Now, individual people can, uh, individual Christians like you and I can, uh, uh, because we have a theocracy in our lives, then we can be governed by God's law, but because the society is democratic and not theocratic. The people, the people govern and not God. That's where the difficulty comes in. And that's where we have to, what we have to grapple with as Christians because now the laws are are changing based on what the people want and who they want to govern them and we 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 now are dealing with well do we keep god's laws or do we go with people <laughs> and because it's a democratic society unfortunately this is just my opinion. We have to go with the um, the way the people are govern governing, and I'm under like I I think that um, although it says the earth, and I was asking the Lord about this um, to myself, I said, well, I said. Um, the Bible said the earth is yours and the fullness thereof. So, don't you want us to be, uh, to take back your world? And he says, yes. He said to me, yes. He said to me, yes, the earth is mine, but the people are not mine. Unless they accept me into their life as their Lord and Savior, then they're mine. But other than that, they're not mine until they accept me. The earth is mine, but the people are not mine. And I was like, wow. And it was just astounding to me. Um, and also, there is a dictatorship where it is one man rules and the others have to follow. Um, parts of China operate this way and parts of the world operate this way where, where one man has the iron fist and he just rules it. The people have got to follow when the people don't have a say. And sometimes in a dicta dictatorship societies, uh, people are severely punished. So I was, I was like, Lord, okay, if it's a democratic society, how do we, how do we still remain believers in a democratic society? 
I said, well, he said, it's not up to Christians to change laws. It's up to us to show the love of God to people. So, because we can't change laws, um, because we're in a democratic society and changing laws is totally, um, not totally impossible, but it is extremely hard. He said, now as Christians, what we need to do is not focus so much on changing laws and overturning laws, but what we need to do is focus on people, showing them the love of Christ, uh, showing them the way into the kingdom to say this is the way, because if there are less people in that in this way of thinking, there'll be less need for laws. See, in a democratic society, the laws reflect um, the mores and needs of the people. So, the way to change it that is not to go protesting and, and overturning laws. That will just uh, uh, make people think of God as a dictator that we we just have to follow this because God says so. He's a dictator. Like I said, dicta dictatorship is one man, um, one man leading and the other ones following. And uh, and because this is not a theoc a, and because this is not a theocratic government where God's law is law, um, to do that would be not so not so good. And what we're trying to do is enforce Christian laws on in ways that it wasn't meant to be enforced. The Lord the Lord genu genuinely wants people to come to him willingly, wants people to have a relationship with him. He does not want people to be, to be forced to have to have to succumb to his laws because they're the laws of the society. He's, he's not a dictator like I talked about dictatorship. He's a loving God who wants a relationship with you. And when when uh, we as Christians force our will on people with the laws of a, de a democratic nation, people will will turn and say, well, if Christians feel like that, I'm, like, I don't want to be one because that seems like a dictatorship. Um, and I said this a few weeks ago. I said the Lord thrives on choice. And sometimes with choice, people choose the right way and the, the wrong way. And when you give people choice, giving people choice is a risk. Giving people choice is a risk because they could choose well or they could choose poorly. And you've seen, we've seen in society where in a democratic society where people have chosen well and people have chosen poorly. And when they choose poorly, they suffer the consequences. And when they choose well, they have gl glorious results. So, so I can sense the Lord saying,
lead well. And not only just lead well, lead with God on your mind. So, going back to the beginning, when I said a leader for um, has to lead himself first, lead yourself well. Some of you, while your life is in this in this array, is that you're not leading yourself well. How can you lead your family well if you can't lead yourself? If you can't rule and guide yourself the right way, how do you expect to do that with your family? Get your house in order, the Lord says. And if you're leading a family, if you learn to lead yourself, your family will follow. The reason why your family is in disarray is because you're not lead, leading yourself. And the first key to leading yourself is getting in line with the Holy Spirit and and casting a vision for yourself and your life and then you go back to God and cast vision for your family. And without vision people perish. And they say um they say um for a lack of knowledge people perish but as I said before I think for a lack of vision, people perish because people can have knowledge and still perish because they they don't see wh where they're going. They don't have any direction, and and direction can change, but at least you have a starting point. Um, direction will give you vision will give you at least a starting point. And the Lord is saying right now, He's saying, start somewhere. Start somewhere. Start anywhere. Just start somewhere. And it, and it will take twists and turns, but at least you're starting. At least you're trying. God's saying right now to somebody, give me something to work with. Give me something to work with. And he's also saying, for those of you with children, he's saying, get your house in order. He's saying, your house, what I mean by your house, I mean your family, your life has been in disorder for so long. You're asking God to bless your house and bless your family. But he's saying, I, he's saying, I am not the author of confusion nor disorder. He's saying, get your house in order. Bring proper leadership to that house. Sir, you need to bring leadership to your wife and your family. You cannot lead when you're distant, you have to be present to lead in your house. And for your, for single moms, you can lead in your life too. You can lead your children if unfortunately you don't have a husband through death or divorce or maybe you weren't married, you made a few mistakes, you can still lead. You've still been given the proper tools to lead. You don't need a man to lead at all. Although proper headship um, says the, the man is supposed to lead, to lead, but with other men you can lead just as well. Leading takes listening and learning as well too. So leading takes listening and 
learning. You can't lead unless you're willing to listen. Listen to those around you. Listen to your wife. Listen to your husband. Even listen to your children. Because your revelation, you're praying for revelation from God, but that revelation could come from your children and your wife or your attendants or your mo mom. God can use, the, God often uses those around you to bring you his revelation. And the reason your house is in disorder is you're not listening or learning. The Lord says you need to start listening and learning to those those around you and start being present in the lives of people around you. So many people in families are not present. They're physically there, but they're not mentally there. Being present is... Um, being emotionally, physically, financially um, in tune with your family, in tune with your life. A lot of people are not in tune with their, their lives. They let things happen to them and they're like, why, why did this happen? Well, it was a lack of leadership in your life. It was a lack of understanding a lack of vision in your life and you just went with the flow and sometimes going with the flow is great it's great to be like whatever but when it comes to the seriousness of your life you need to be physically emotionally financially um spiritually present in your life and when you're f fully present in the moment of your life, that's when things happen. When you don't let things happen uh, just to you, you let them happen for you and through you, that's when things begin to happen. Thank you guys for... For, for being with me and talking about leadership, one of my favorite topics. Uh, one, I love to read, as you guys know, and I've read books by CEOs, and one of the best books, um, I've read many books, I've read um, by the CEO of Dunkin' Donuts, the CEO of McDonald's. Um, I've read many. The CEO of Disney. But the best book by a CEO I've read is called From Worst to First. Um, I forget the author, but it's called From Worst to First. It's about how an airline went from the worst airline ever to the top and and the structures that were put in place and a good a good leader whether you're leading yourself or whatever needs structure but but not so much structure need, needs I should say structural balance you need structure but not so much structure that it's rigid and you can't change your structure needs to be flexible whether you're leading yourself or whether you're leading an organization most times in leadership you need to bend you need to be able to bend and then you need to, um, and then you can feel free to go with the flow. Going with the flow, just having no structure, that's a problem. But going with the flow while having a structure will 
will make your leadership, whether you're leading yourself or a company, stronger. So guys, thank you um, for being with me today. I really appreciate it. Bye.